Welcome to the Global Philosophy of Religion Project at the University of Birmingham, led by Professor Eugen Nagazawa. We at Closer to Truth are pleased to participate. Maria Helena Gorsi is guest professor in the Department of Languages and Culture at Ghent University in Belgium. Her research fields are Jainism, Buddhism, South Asian philosophy, and comparative philosophy. We explore the existence and nature of God or deities in the Jain religious tradition. So, Maria Helena, let's start with a brief overview of Jainism as both a religious tradition and a philosophical system. Um, you've written that Jainism is a soteriology, a salvation story, in which metaphysical considerations, which is our focus, are subordinated to ethical ones. So while we do want to focus on the metaphysical, uh, let's first understand Jainism in its own sense as a soteriology, a salvation story, um, and as you put it, with seven categories. So how does that work? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, so your theology with seven categories, uh, that's the way I put it. Um, maybe maybe I can just, first of all, focus on before the categories on the soteriological is itself, because Jainism, I think, is... Um, is not as uh, known as other religious traditions of India. So maybe I can just start by the yeah, positing the very um, big concepts uh, to begin with. Um, you might know that Jainism is one of the main religious tradition and philosophical traditions of India uh, and developing in the same cultural background than Hinduism and Buddhism. You will see that it shares many affinities with those traditions as well. Uh, and it emerged more specifically as an ascetic movement around uh, the fifth century before the common area. So around the figure of Mahavira. Mahavira is the founder, is not the founder of this tradition, which has older roots, but um, is one of the very few individuals who has reached salvation. And as such, is the last reformer to revive the faith. So in this cultural background, karma theories are prevalent. Uh, you know that... Um, you know, karma theories, I, I'm, you might have uh, discussed that with other participants already. Uh, uh, our karma, the consequences of our acts uh, in previous lives, uh, determines our current situation in life. So we really need to understand that in a, in a, in a strong way. Huh? Even a cloud of earth exists as earth because it's, it has earned this particular niche in the wider system. So the world of nature cannot be separated from moral order. This is important to keep in mind for later discussions. Mm. Um, besides, this also explains why, um, even though bad things sometimes happen to good people and good things to bad people, uh, there is still a universal justice because um, this justice is simply spanning over a period of time that exceeds our abilities to know it. So um, I'm saying that because in such a paradigm, the focus is not on the performance of rituals or sacrifice as it was in the Vedic background, but it is on an inner fight, an inner fight to get rid of bad karma and ultimately to get rid of old karma theology. And this fight is based on ascetic practice of self-discipline and of renunciation. So for example, um, meditation or mortification of the flesh and the abandonment of a comfortable life, uh, even the abandonment of clothes for certain monks. And I think Jainism is uh, well known from those nude monks uh, uh, today, uh, amongst other things. And here the model is not that of the priest. The model um, is not that of the priest who is born pure, um, but the model is that of the warrior, the warrior who builds his or her also uh, purity. Uh, by the way, Mahavira, the central figure, uh, meet hero. And a peculiarity of Jainism um, that we might not discuss later on today is to essentially associate these renunciatory liberating practices uh, with the imperative of nonviolence. Nonviolence is very central uh, because at the heart of Jainism, um, each living being uh, is the embodiment of the soul. And this we are going to speak a lot, I think, uh, in our ontological um, discussions on, on the soul. What is the soul? This soul, I can already tell that it, it's unlimited knowledge, unlimited perception, unlimited bliss, and unlimited energy. Uh, and there are such souls uh, embodied even in tiniest creatures, so like bacteria or insects. This is why you will see the monks or the nuns um, 
wearing a mask even before COVID or yeah, sweeping their way uh, before they walk, they have to to to, to wear also um, um, something to a whisk to sweep the ground in front of them. So um, we should have in an we should act in a non harming way uh, towards every living creatures which are embodiment of a, um, this soul. And we should, of course, be aware of the presence of the soul within us. Each human being can uh, individually progress within a spiritual path of liberation, of purification of his or soul, until it becomes this unlimited knowledge. And this is done thanks to a fight uh, against one's passion, I told, um, because uh, passions act like the karma of the worst kind. Uh, to explain karma, um, bad karma sticks to the soul and obstructs its ability. So if you, um, let me explain in those words, if you desire something, you are born in a mental state, and this uh, mental state is completely alien to the real unlimited character of yourself. So Jain worships the few individuals who have won uh, the fight, the inner fight over passions and have achieved enlightenment, which is omniscience, uh, and they are called Jain. In Sanskrit, so the giants are the followers of the jina. So to come back to your question about uh, the seven categories, and now that we have, I think, a, a broad view of, of sociology that is being practiced, um, I suggest we have a look at uh, the Tattvarta Sutra, uh, which means the treatise on categories or the treatise on what there is, uh, written in Sanskrit around the second century. It is regularly, traditionally presented as the essence of classical Jainism the first philosophical treatise of classical Jainism. So it opens with the following verse. The path to liberation is constituted by right worldview, right knowledge, right conduct. Right worldview is confidence in the categories. And the categories are self, non-self, uh, influx, binding, stopping, destruction, and liberation. So we have seven categories, so to speak. Okay, all right, yeah. so, now, so yeah. that's very good. So we understand the historical nature of Jainism, how it developed, and the, the moral or, or salvation story as its core. Um, and the ontological foundation of it, it seems to be the soul, and we'll get to a lot of that. Uh, but in terms of what our orientation is, in terms of the existence uh, and nature of, 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 God, of God or deities, uh, Jainism does not have a God or deity. So I, I want to ask in the Jain tradition, um, are, there, are there arguments for the non-existence of God? There are arguments, obviously, for the existence of soul and how that all works. But um, because it grows up in, um, in in, in a world that, that most religions do have a, a God, versions of Hinduism uh, uh, do as well, and then deities. Uh, are there arguments within the Jain tradition why there is no God or there are no deities in the, in the, in the sense of other religious groups? Um, thank you for your question. It's um, I don't know where to begin because I would like to argue that there is a God in Chinese. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, in there is one way to 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 say that there is at least a divine being that uh, check a lot of the boxes that the uh, usual um, meaning of God has. Uh, but maybe I can start with the with your question on the the arguments uh, against or for the existence of a God as we usually understand it, um, because there there is actually a very long tradition of exchanges of argument pro and against uh, a God in the Indian framework. Um, but um, maybe we need to rephrase this question. Philosophers are not really interested in proving, proving or refuting that uh, God exists. In general, uh, maybe except Buddhists, because Buddhists, uh, they want to prove that God does not exist because the, it's part of their general proof that no persisting entity uh, whatsoever exists. But uh, usually philosophers are more interested in proving or refuting that a uh, divine entity has given abilities, uh, given effects uh, on us, especially does it preside over the making of the world or um, uh, over karmic retribution, or is it the legitimation of the validity of sacred texts, um, things like this. And giants are especially um, uh, very interested in two exchanges of arguments uh, in those lines. And the first is that 
uh, they want to prove that God is not the arranger of the world. The world has not been made by a God. Mm. Uh, and I say arranger and not creator because um, because the the one who propounds um, who propounds arguments in favor of God as the arranger of the world um, is the Nyayaika uh, school, a Brahmanical tradition. And they say that uh, according to whom atoms atoms exist permanently. So God doesn't make the atoms, but the atoms are arranged by the Lord. And what is the non-permanent is the arrangement uh, of permanent entities, actually. Mm-hmm. And the main, uh, there are many proofs, uh, but the main proof that I have seen again and again refuted by the giants uh, is the following one. Uh, the world as a conscience producer, especially mountains have a conscience producer uh, because they are a product and whatever is a product also has a conscience maker. For example, it's like the pot. Uh, so this is part of, a, you can feel it already, a very regulated uh, framework. There are, are a lot of rules to um, assert a thesis and attack it and defend it. Mm-hmm. Um, and also you might see that uh, if we if we want to view parallelism with um, the arguments that uh, exist in the West, uh, this argument can be called between a theological and a cosmological argument. Um, because you see, a theological argument, the complexity of the world is enough that it is necessary to have a conscience designer, while a cosmological argument says that the um, perishing aspect of the things around us uh, calls for the need for a non-perishing primary cause. Because mm-hmm. if perishing thing is made by another perishing thing, which is made by another perishing thing, it's a regress at infinitum. Mm-hmm. And here we have something right in the middle. Uh, it is because perishing things are uh, all around us that it is necessary uh, to postulate uh, an intelligent designer. Uh, because something is perishing only if it is made of parts, uh, so on, only if there is an arranger of it. Um, and here, um, and here is what the giants are trying to refute uh, within, a, I, as I said, a highly regulated debate uh, within which the, the, the they are trying to say that it's okay or not okay to transfer one property um, uh, to, yeah, to a similar case or not. And here, the, is it okay or not to transfer the property being made by a conscience producer from a product to another? Or should we transfer the property made by a conscience producer from one artifact and not a product in general to another artifact. Mm. So this is the kind of questionings that they, uh, they will develop. So highly technical uh, discussions, uh, but maybe more interesting for us today are a few arguments that um, some giants are, um, are asserting against uh, God as an arranger of the world, uh, especially uh, Gunaratna in the 15th century, uh, who is a commentator of Haribhadra in the 8th century on that. Uh, he will say that, for example, I'm just quoting a few because there are a lot of refutations of it. Uh, all the examples of artifacts that we have are made by uh, producers who are impermanent, non-omniscient, uh, with a body, uh, not all producing, etc. And they say, do you really want your God uh, to be likewise? We you want your God to be this kind of producer? Um, so of course, of course, the, the Naya won't, won't, won't argue that they do. Uh, also, of course, they will argue something else. I'm stopping just at the giant refutation here because it can go a long way. Um, they also say, and that I was looking at the more specifically giant uh, refutations, um, they say that if the God makes the world out of compassion, uh, then God has not get got rid of all his passions, uh, which is actually a default in uh, in the giants. So uh, the same way goes from uh, for if God made the world for fun or to be the instrument of the retribution of karma, it means that he still uh, has intentions. It, he has not got rid of all his passions, and it's not good. Um, and a lot of arguments like that. Uh, what does being divine mean? Uh, is it? It's not the ability to create. Otherwise, Mahavira, who is divine, uh, would create, but he doesn't. So these kind of uh, arguments are, are going on. Um, so let, let's um, hmm. let's try to uh, uh, parse yeah. this a little bit. Um, it, 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 the distinction between there being 
a uh, an affirmative arranger, not a creator, because the, there is the permanence, the this yeah. uh, this uh, original atom or atomism, which we'll talk about a little bit yeah. later, um, exists always. So that's an existence. So there is an arranger um, that sounds like it. There's a will. There is a an, an independent objective that has that consciousness as opposed to a system in which there are all these souls that are that are that create the, the fundamental reality. Um, so that sounds like a pretty profound difference uh, between how the the totality works uh, between sort of impersonal souls that um, that each one have their own world and a, a karmic kind of cyclical of, approach to life to a singular arranger. Um, so, so is that sharp distinction clear? And is there a dispute between them? Or is, is the, the Jain system somewhat different? The, the, yeah, yeah, what you said is really yeah, uh, uh, to the point. And the, the Jain system is actually very, very close to the Nyayika system in terms of uh, theory of causation. Uh, and also uh, atomisms, uh, but uh, the main difference is that, uh, yeah, as you said, huh, there is no uh, no creator of the world, uh, and especially not one single creator. Also, okay, so, that, yeah. so that's a very important distinction. Yeah. There's no a single. There's certainly no creator because everything's always existed. Uh, so that answers the question: Why is there something rather than nothing? Which is our favorite. Question on positive truth, which we 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 put to all religious groups, but here it's a simple answer because there always was something, so the yes. question doesn't even exist. <laughs> so that's good. I like to get those. I like to get questions uh, like yes. that. Yes, is really cyclical in Jainism, so it's a cycle that goes again and again and again and never stops. Sure, and it never started, and so and it never started. Yes, and it's over there. So that's great. Um, so in order to drill down on this, let me ask the question in a different way. In, in Jaina philosophy, uh, what is fundamental reality? Uh, what, what are the characteristics of fundamental reality? And one of the ways we, we ask the question is what exists? Uh, the question, what exists? And, and what this means is what are the fundamental non-reducible categories of reality. And I know that, that you've written this nice phrase that uh, the Jainism is a dualism with six categories, eternal substances. Uh, so what are they? How do they interrelate? And how do they form this fundamental reality of the Jain, Jaina system? So yes, what ultimately exists. Um, so I, as I said, um, so I was speaking about seven categories, but uh, within those seven categories, you could have a sense uh, of the fact that uh, the two first of them are really what exists. Because um, so uh, as I said, then there is the self, the non-self, and then the influx, um, the, the binding, the stopping, the destruction, and the liberation. So uh, you see that... Um, um, the two categories, the self and the non-self, uh, the inanimate and the animate, uh, in Sanskrit, the jiva and the ajiva, form the core um, the core elements uh, in what exists. And, and this core categorial uh, differentiation between self and non-self is really what is most important in Jainism. You, if, you, if we want to put Jainism in a nutshell, it's really uh, self is uh, completely radically different from non-self. And being liberated is to uh, be aware of that and be uniquely self. Um, so in trying to analyze this, yeah. uh, the different categories, uh, I, I want to understand the, the salvation soteriology, the seven categories, and then the which, which, sound, which is a process-oriented sense of how you get salvation is a process. And yes. so categories of a process are, um, are, are have a different nature than the categories of an ontology, yes. which is what is reality. So I'm trying to understand that distinction because as you as you've listed some of the categories, some of them sound like ontology, like there are selves and maybe those are souls and things that are not 
yourself and not yes exactly <laughs> uh, and that's one category and then then the other things the the are are movement things that the uh the ontological uh, substances do or, or happen to them or um are are ideas about what they should do uh normative or prescriptive mm -hmm. so the, the categories have different elements to them so i, I want to understand how they work in terms of the basic salvation categories and then the ontological categories of what exists. That makes sense? Yes, yes, that does. Uh, except that um, if I may, I would li like to start with the, the ontological categories, so then it's easier to, to okay. say how they, how they we get liberated when... Uh, okay. Um, yeah, because first of all, the... Um, uh, let's start with the Givani. Let's start with the, the, the self... Um, so the self is really um, um, a single cell, uh, so a single celled entity, which really is like a monad, um, non-communicated. When it's liberated in its liberated state, it's not, not communicating with anything whatsoever. Um, there are an infinity of self selves. Uh, there uh, is a self in every uh, living entity when it's embodied. Um, and uh, next to these uh, self, you have uh, the non-selves. And the non-self uh, is a category that encompasses uh, five, uh, five other uh, categories, which each of them is a substance. It's called a substance, uh, which are the, the medium of motion, the medium of rest, the space, uh, the matter, and the time. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So this is, this is, let, let's go. Let's start with the self. It's, that's yeah. interesting. Uh, and you're saying it's a, it's a single cell. Does that mean it, it has no parts? Uh, there no, part. no parts. So it's. I think in general, uh, in the Indian paradigm, uh, if you want to be permanent, you have to have no parts. Okay. All right. So the, the, so each one is permanent. We have an infinite number of those. Yes. Um, and they're they're undifferentiated, and then they get somehow expressed in in different life forms uh, from bacteria and insects to, to, to humans on a, a scale. And so we, each of those souls, um, which start out um, uh, uh, with no parts and undifferentiated become differentiated or have expressions based on where they wind up. They, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, they become differentiated in as much as uh, the, the, the self will take the size of the body it, uh, it occupies. Uh, because if you have no self at the yeah, end of your hands, then your hands won't be able to feel anything. If you have feelings, that it means that the self is there. The self uh, uh, functions like a lamp that, um, that enlights uh, a room. So it can have their various um, uh, styles. Uh, no, it's not uh, differentiated in as much as it's not the self itself that uh, that changes. Um, so, but then, then again, a lot of authors will have a, a lot of different interpretation. But basically, um, um, basically, the the compound uh, uh, which is made of um, self and matter, but it's not only self and matter; it's especially self and karmic matter. Uh, the compound will change, uh, but the self itself, uh, some will say, uh, was never really embodied <laughs> and has never really uh, yeah, been part of this uh, karmic process. So uh, you have to re realize uh, that to, 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 to become free. It's one of the very uh, fertile ideas here. So um, I, I wouldn't say that uh, the, the selves become differentiated. The atoms do become differentiated. Oh, okay. um, so, so let's, let's distinguish. Yeah between ce uh, the, the cells, which are the, the essence of a soul, which doesn't become different, and the atoms. Now, the, 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 the atoms also have a permanence to them, but that relates to the non-self, that relates to the inanimate world. Uh, are those parallel it, 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 in the sense that a soul is, is, uh, is, is permanent in the um, in the mental world, for lack of a better term, and the atom is is the the cell, if you will, of the 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 uh, non mental or the inanimate world. Something like this, yeah. And and the the atoms that constitute the the matter, uh, they start being um, 
undifferentiated uh, without, they say, without a beginning, a middle, nor an end. Uh, and then they become atom of, mat of uh, earth, atom of uh, water, atom of fire, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they can be perceived only when there is an, an agglomerate. Uh, so the, the world is called the, the big aggregates. Uh, and, and, and this is the, the perceivable world around us is, is completely made of uh, aggregates of atom of matter. So, so would it be fair to say in one way of looking at the question of, of, of what exists, is to say that two things exist at the most fundamental level. There are the the souls, the cells, the undifferentiated cells that become that mm -hmm. become all uh, selves, uh, even even any kind of self, bacteria, insects, etc. Uh, and then there are the atoms, which are the fundamental, unchanging aspects that be, that become expressed in these different forms um, of the material world. Oh yes, but I uh, maybe I wouldn't say this because because you have also the the the, the principle of rest, the principle of motion and space and oh. time. Okay, th those are all those are those are all all good, but those are uh, the, 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 the sense of motion and rest are things that those um, fundamental ontological elements, the souls and the atoms, do. They're, they're process oriented. Now, space and time are, if you will, in this simple version, the, the stage on which they do it, um, yeah. in a sense, um, a, looking at the, 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 the philosophical scheme on, 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 in its own sense, not, not, not bringing in physics or Einstein or anything here. Yeah, uh, but I, I would just want to, to, to stress the fact that there is a tendency to physicalized elements in Jainism. So, so, so really the movement, the, the principle of movement, uh, rest uh, and time and space, they are substances. Um, for example, the, 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 um, uh, the principle of motion is compared to water in which species move. So you can really see it uh, as, a, as a type of substance. So I appreciate that the uh, things that I would call process like motion and rest, are within the Jaina system looked upon as substances, as sort of fundamental things that are going on. But we just need to recognize that the fundamental aspects within Jainism in terms of these categories have, have differences in terms of their um, ontological standing, if you will. Um, but what I want to now do is kind of bring us back to you know, the focus of, of this, uh, of this uh, whole project in terms of, um, of God and deities, because the systems that we're describing now in terms of the cells and the self and the soul and the atoms and, and these different um, uh, other kinds of substances like motion and rest and space and time, um, the, the, it, they seem to be a process that has always been working and really doesn't seem to need an even an arranger, much less a creator. So one can understand the internal consistency is once you set this process in motion or once it's always been in this motion, maybe that's a better way to put it, um, there really is no need for a traditional God or, or, or even an arranger because it's all, it's all just happening. Yes, even though the giants are not the Mimamsakas, uh, but, th but there, is, there is no need of an arranger in, in Jainism. It, it, yeah, completely no need. It's not even theorized because, <laughs> as you said, yeah, the world is functioning as it does. It's and, and, it, and it always has, and there was no always beginning has, to it, and it's just a, a cyclical approach. Okay, well, that, that's good. So let, let's now focus a little bit. Uh, in Jaina philosophy <clears throat> on what these souls uh, are or how they work. Uh, I read somewhere, you know, again, I'm really a neophyte in this in Jainism, so please correct me. I'm happy to be corrected. But it says that, uh, I read someplace that souls, um, you know, can have a godlike feature that, that, that souls are some I think have said souls are God or are godlike or have a kind of godliness. Um, is is that a, an accurate uh, uh, analysis? But I would say so, yes, because um, because once not 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 uh, as 
embodied, but once liberated, it's like a god. There is this uh, divine self within us that we have to purify. Um, really, um, yeah, it's a god. If if we if you look at the, the classifications, uh, the attributes of gods in in manuals of philosophy of religion, you have eternity. You have independence, you have goodness, omniscience, simplicity, freedom, uh, immutability, necessity, uh, both incarnate and then transcendent. Uh, the divine self in Jainism um, checks all the boxes, uh, as I as I was indicating. But uh, uh, only those um, spiritual fighters who, fighters who have managed to burn all their passion and have managed to become enlightened and then liberate itself. So yes, I would say that uh, this could be uh, conceived as gods, uh, god-like entities. The, the only thing is that they cannot interact whatsoever with the, with the world anymore. Once so, once they are enlightened, oh. uh, when all bad karmas are burnt, then they can still act because there are still non-harming karma at, um, at, that are active and which uh, determine, for example, the span uh, lifespan. So they, they are still alive and they can walk, they can preach and they can meditate. Uh, but it's uh, by nature, it's impossible for them to harm uh, anything around them. Uh, and they are already enlightened, so they can preach. And the giant corpus comes from such an enlightened being, uh, an authoritative being without intention. And only when the, all the karma is exhausted, even the non-harming one, only then they become liberated and then go to a Sid Haloka, a realm of an, um, of liberated beings, uh, then they cannot interact in any way with the world. And you know that uh, if you go in the giant temple, you will see a lot of um, statues of uh, gods and goddesses over the deities, which are and the giants pay homage to them, like uh, Sarasvati, um, for example, um, be because they, they they still need also some gods with whom they can interact and ask for some favors and the like. But uh, it's very important to know that those gods and those goddesses uh, have a very low status. Uh, in the universe, you have... Um, so they, they, have, they are uh, living in the state of bliss in the realm of uh, the gods and the goddesses, but uh, because, because they have done some good deeds in previous lives, but once their uh, life karma will be exhausted, then they will die, and uh, if they are lucky, they will be embodied again in the human realm. Why, I, why do I say that? Because only human beings can be completely liberated. Yeah. You have to go back to a human life before you can be liberated. Uh, but it's good to be a god at the moment because uh, at the moment we are uh, in a cosmic period at which we cannot get liberated uh, because there is too much misery and not enough happiness. Mm -hmm. We need a good balance uh, to, to, to be able to practice uh, meditation and austerities for a long time. Mm. So good that to be a god and wait for some um, billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of years, and then you can uh, embody yourself as a human being again and get liberated. Uh, so I'm, I'm just only saying that uh, because maybe the definition of god could be broadened uh, as to also ex uh, accept divine entities like uh, the liberated soul in Jainism that has so many um, attributes of gods, except for the making of the world or the being uh, present in interaction with human beings, so or, or yeah, or just or just yeah, sorry, or, or just um, instead of saying gods and deities, maybe we can say worship beings or something like this. So that these are yeah, two Look, things I, that I'm thinking. I think about. this is a very important area to probe yes. in, in understanding the uh, the the existence and nature of God and and, and deities. Uh, first of all, I want to understand that when a, a soul is liberated, ultimate liberation. That's a permanent event. There, there can't be anything nothing. after that. Yeah, so that, nothing, nothing. Once uh, that happens, yes. that's forever. That's forever. a permanent yeah. forever. And, and at that point, one would use this term God, because what you did very nicely was, was uh, articulating all the characteristics that we generally put on, on God, um, except in, including, I think you said, worthy of worship uh, at, at that point. So you have all of the characteristics of God, 
except for the creator part. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Which, you know, obviously is a fundamental uh, part of, of God in, the, in theistic religions. And, um, and it, 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 it is also um, in theistic religions that God has an independence from the creation. So the fact that you created it is one thing, but it's an, but it is another thing to recognize that therefore God is independent of it. But here we're taking rather than the term God because that's so ambiguous and we have uh, we have weighted it with the baggage of how we think of God in the West. But if you peel off the characteristics of God and you know bliss and goodness and uh, uh, various characteristics, those characteristics are then, uh, appended to or embodied, embodied is a bad word, but part of the the liberated soul. So yeah. you can you have a lot of godlike characteristics, is the way we might want to put it, because the word God is so ambiguous. Yes, and it's actually, um, and it's even, I would say, interacting with us just only that, in as much as uh, we were able to uh, before he was liberated to. Um, have the teaching and uh, interpret it and pass it on through generations and generations of um, of people who memorized it. So, so we are following, um, yeah, the path of the liberated ones, liberated ones. Sorry. So, because souls are the essence of what we would say is God or can become like God and using that term, let's dig into the deep ontology of souls that um, uh, enable this, this process or this transformation to become like God. So we understand within Jainism, what is, what is God? Because that is what these souls become. So what can we say about the deep ontology of souls? So um, there are, um two characteristics which I would say uh, are very important to, uh, to understand the soul. A soul is, um, first of all, uh, permanent. That's the, uh, one of the main characteristics. And the second one is that uh, it is um, active and sentient. Uh, activity and sentience are, uh, is the, the very important second characteristic of the soul. The problem being that... Um, the problem being that... Um, how can you reinit the fact that something is permanent and the fact that this very same thing is subject to modification? So, uh, like the Mimamsaka, the Jains will argue against the Buddhists and will say that, uh, yes, it is possible for one and the very same entity to have uh, many uh, apparently contradictory um, properties. And this is such because uh, there is uh, an infinity, an infinite, an infinite number of aspects of a thing, and giants are realists. So saying that there is an infinite um, number of aspects of a thing uh, actually um, um, is their only way to say that there is uh, many different perspectives on it. Uh, if there are many different perspectives on a thing, it's because the thing by itself it is complex. Uh, and so this is one of the most famous uh, theories of the Jain. Maybe you've heard of that. It's called the non-one-sidedness of things. Uh, Anikanta Vada in Sanskrit. And it's, uh, it, um, it, yeah, it, it, it means that uh, any object of knowledge uh, is fundamentally, essentially complex. And uh, when, uh, for example, uh, the, the most uh, direct disciple of uh, Mahavira was asking him, Lord, is the soul permanent or impermanent? You see that the soul is really the fundamental uh, entity that the giants are, are, yeah. are questioning, and permanence is one of the fundamental qualities. And uh, he asks to Mahavira, is the soul permanent or impermanent? And Mahavira answers, the soul is permanent as well as impermanent. Uh, from the point of view of substance, it is permanent. From the point of view of state, it undergoes birth, decay, and destruction. Mm. Uh, then we can go on. Is it uh, finite or infinite? Well, uh, in the point of view of substance, it is finite, uh, for it is countable as one. There is only one uh, soul uh, for uh, each living being. From the point of view of its area, uh, it is finite, for uh, it has um, 
a very high but still um, a finite number of parts, and it occupies a very high but still finite number of space points. But not from the point of view of time, it's infinite. Uh, it uh, never ceases, uh, it has uh, never started, it was always there. And from the point of view of the modification, it's also infinite because it has infinite modifications. Mm. Uh, so you see, this is the theory of the, the plurality of aspects of uh, any knowable, and this is very essential. Mm. And from that, uh, they, they do develop uh, the theory of viewpoint, uh, the Nayavada, uh, which is a kind of theory of theories of knowledge. Uh, what are the all the different ways we can what are the ultimately relevant uh, characteristic of a thing we can focus on for a given uh, for a given um, way of conceiving the world and also for a given uh, soteriological path? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that this um, theories of the giants uh, is a very interesting way of a, a new classification, which can be maybe of a lot of use for philosophy of religion, uh, because it will associate the 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 complexity of the real and, and the type of aspect we want to focus on uh, with linked with their um, conception of the divinity and with their conception, conception of what is the good path, how uh, should we behave mm. um, to, 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 yeah. So in that sense, uh, what would you say is, Jaina, epistemology, the, the ways of knowing fundamental reality? Uh, for example, uh, you know, how necessary is renunciation because that's part of the tradition. Must one go through, um, one must take a, a renunciation of, of, the, of the, the sensory pleasures of the world in order to achieve this. Uh, if that's so, you know, I'm probably not a candidate. <laughs> uh, very few people are. This is why I think it is so important for them to have a, uh, a lot, a lot of tools, strong tools to help us in that way, and this is why also their all cosmology, for example, uh, is is um, is meant to help us uh, being part of a, a framework which which will only lead us to to better bettering of ourselves. Mm. So, so in in souls, because they are so, so important in this process, and. <clears throat> the process of purification or liberation or salvation, th that the souls become into this God-like state and become what in Jainism would be equivalent of God, or whether each individual soul is God-like or the totality is 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 like God. Um, what is that? That seems to be like the most fundamental part of reality that you have this process of souls becoming godlike. Is that fair to say that that's the, the ultimate bedrock fundamental nature of reality is that process? Uh, yes, and, and I would add that um, the, the fundamental bedrock of reality is really to be aware of the fact that karmic matter is completely uh, different in type uh, from um, what the self is. Okay, so that so that's important. So, how would you then compare uh, Jaina ontology with those of the, you know classic theistic religions, the Abrahamic uh, uh, traditions of uh, of uh, 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 Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and many forms of Hinduism, which are also theistic? How, how would you then compare them? I might start with um, the forms of theism, you said in, in yeah, different types of Hinduism, uh, you know that Jainism um, um, borrows a lot, but all tradition do, uh, and, and, and Jainism has borrowed a lot from Samkhya uh, philosophy. I don't know if someone has presented Samkhya uh, in this series of uh, podcasts, but, um, but Jainism is basically a uh, a development of Samkhya. This is as much, uh, yeah, they have borrowed a lot. And Samkhya, uh, Samkhya is really the, um, uh, a dualism um, that differentiate between what is a, a subject and what is an object. And all what is in the purview of reality of what we experience uh, is this um, object that thinks it is a subject, but it is not. And you know, it was also the, the it was also the basis, the metaphysical basis of all the, the classical yoga tradition. And, and we have to, 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 
to be aware that we are not an object, we are part of the subject. But subjects are completely isolated uh, uh, things that have nothing to do uh, with the empirical world. Uh, so, um, and here, uh, part of the, so the yogic tradition at some point was theistic because there was Ishvara, but the Lord, the Lord, but Ishvara was more a model yogin than anything else. It was not the creator of the world. So I don't know if it, uh, <laughs> if it is theistic in the sense that you are uh, telling this to us. And then, but you know that uh, Advaita Vedanta and Vedanta is, can also be thought of as a kind of development from Samkhya also. But then there is no Purusha and Prakriti, there is no um, subject and object. Um, every, um, everything uh, is the same. Uh, I mean, they, they ju just, um, um, it's a monism uh, within which we have to realize that uh, we are ultimately, ultimately, we are all Brahman. There are only uh, types of manifestation of Brahman, and we are uh, only ultimately made of the same dough. Uh, yeah, the world is made of Brahman as a table is made of wood. Uh, so this is also kind of development of Samkhya, actually. Uh, would you call it theistic? Yes, when we said that, um, yeah, this is the, this consciousness uh, inherit everything in the world. Uh, in that in that way, uh, um, proto Samkhya and Jainism are, are more alike because. Uh, Consciousness, which is divine, is completely out of the world. And here it's uh, absolutely everywhere within us, but it doesn't manifest uh, fully uh, in the limited beings uh, that we are. Uh, in uh, Jainism, it's a bit different. It's not that it doesn't manifest fully. It's that um, it is impeded and we have to remove things like uh, we have to polish uh, the metal so that it shines again. Mm. So it's... Um, so I don't know. I am. It's it's hard to to yeah. <laughs> so this is how uh, the ontology differs um, in in Jainism and in tradition, which are sometimes called theistic, but I'm not sure they are completely <laughs> even of them. And Buddhism is not at all. Yeah. <laughs> so. Is it necessary in, uh, in in Jain philosophy that one must have religious or mystical? or inward experiences in order to access or, or even to understand fundamental reality? Um, yeah, thank you. This is a good question. Um, um, there, there are a lot of different trends in Jainism. There is one especially which insists on, uh, on this inward experience and which will be um, the inspiration for all the later mystic uh, thinkers in Jainism, because there are mystic thinkers in Jainism, and this this um, this person's name is Kunda Kunda. Uh, actually, it's just the the yeah the name of a tradition of um, uh, of text written in Prakrit from the third to the eighth century, approximately. Who says that we don't need um, um, all the rituals that. Because you know, in Jainism, yes, you have you have a concept, but then a lot of rituals are being developed, uh, and, a, and a lot of uh, um, communal practice are being developed. And he says, "Oh, let's go back to the source, uh, to the origin. Uh, we don't need all those rituals. Let us focus on the inward experience of the self." And is the one who um, took this uh, um, very interesting idea that actually was seen also in other tradition in India, that. Um, we should not uh, understand the self as being uh, ever, ever mixed, uh, properly speaking, with karmic matter. Uh, and so if we have a deep, uh, a deep knowledge of, on the self, we understand what uh, its ultimate uh, essence is, that or of pure sentience, pure activity, uh, never, never uh, connected with karma. Uh, and it's connected with karmic matter and karma only in a metaphorical way. Uh, when we say that um, uh, the, the metaphors are the king is doing the war, but the king is not doing the war, only the subjects, uh, which are warriors, are doing the war for the king or something like this. Mm. Um, and so only, only, through, um, only through this uh, inward experience of the self, uh, we can understand how the world is really con yeah, is mm. reconstituted. Um, so, so that would be the part of Jainism that will reject all all of our practices, actually ritualistic practice. Hmm. Okay. 
Um, since in, in Jainism philosophy, we have, um, we have these two elements, the souls that are the uh, animate or the self world, and then the non-self world, we have the atoms which become differentiated. Um, what is the process of causation in the material world? Because some religious traditions would have there be something more than just the physical processes that we could discover in science that there must be some non-physical elements. So in, in Jainism, when you have the atoms in the material world, uh, do, does that, does causation just happen naturally within that world? Or is somehow is the, 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 the souls necessary in the causation process? No, the, no, um, it's never to rise the, this way. Um, the the I've never seen um, the souls being being part of um, this causation so, process actually. So the, because because we have to become actually when they said we have to become completely isolated, independent. We are like monads. Uh, the souls are like monads. So so we should not be taking part of uh, all this all this empirical world in the end. So, so as the world works and the atoms do all their thing, that works fine all by itself in, in the physical world. So th that would be accessible to science in a, in a very normal way if we try to relate the two. Yes, yes. And what should be also accessible to science uh, is the moral processes. I think this is also why the giants tend to physicalize a lot. Um, Okay. They do. They do put. They do develop a highly, highly complex and detailed calculation on um, what does it, um, how the how can a soul expand and um, which type of, of karma are born. So a lot of calculations on that uh, as well. So I think this part also is scientific in their in their eyes. Yeah. Okay, look, uh, this has been fascinating. I, I um, you know, I'm still a neophyte in, in Jainism, but I feel I've maybe made a half a step uh, up. So this has been terrific, uh, Mary Lynn. I, I guess I have one final question. Um, and, and that is, I, I like to ask the different traditions how they view their tradition related to all the others. Um, <clears throat> many religions have an exclusive view that, you know, we have the real truth, others have little parts of the truth. But uh, is there, are there discussions within uh, uh, the Jaina tradition that discusses its, its relationship or hierarchical uh, understanding with other religious groups? Uh, do, in the Jain tradition, do all religions access the same reality, even those that worship creator gods that are independent from the reality, very different. Uh, how, how, how does the, the Jain, Jain of thinking traditionally um, interact with other religious groups? Yeah, thank you, because this is very central in Jainism, actually, and this is tackled especially in their theory of viewpoints. So every, every tradition uh, which has something to contribute uh, really, really uh, contributes genuinely to the debate and add something. For example, uh, they do say that um, the, the, the Buddhists have a very important grasp on what it means to be impermanent, but they also fail at recognizing uh, uh, the permanence uh, aspect, which is also a very important aspect, but they do contribute to the debate. And thanks to them, we do understand a bit more. So every um, every other tradition um, has, in par has its part in the, the global debate, but of course, uh, only the giants are the ones who are able to, 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 to speak about a non-one-sided uh, knowable, these complex uh, objects and complex reality. So um, ultimately, yes, the giant theft <laughs> is, the, is the way to go. <laughs> but the do contribute very well. Well, that is not differentiated from all the other traditions which also believe the same thing about them. <laughs> Themselves. But uh, I may I, I would just like to add that uh, this this is was such a um, to, it was already at the core of this tradition in such a way that uh, they are seen as the secretary of uh, India, 
um, because they do preserve a lot of texts from all of our religious traditions and even more than the others. So, so that was something quite central in their tradition to say that, although it was, as you said, uh, shared by almost everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's really been uh, in enlightening, at least in the, in the small sense. I'm not going to claim <laughs> that I'm now enlightened in a bigger sense. Uh, but as we as we all go along uh, a path, uh, uh, the uh, understanding of how each tradition works and and, and uh, I, is is uh, an important part of our of our total process of understanding humanity. So, Maria Elena, thank you very much for for joining the Global Philosophy of Religion project, and uh, um, we hope to see more of your work in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>